uh, 9th of May uh, 2024. Currently still drilling peas. It's been one of the uh, worst winters ever recorded, which has gone into spring. Uh, it's a very trying time. We wouldn't normally be drilling peas uh, within the last two weeks, but it's been our first opportunity. You can see in the background that you've got Sandy there, who's on the powerhouse drill. Um, he's um, getting stuck and you can see in the black lines in the fields where uh, that's the sign where the water is and uh, so each pass is having to unblock the drill and carry on again. We're trying to find the land drains so uh, we've got a brook at the bottom of this field uh, if you pan around and look just here. We've, um, we, we, we've got a rough idea on three what words where the pipe is so we just tried to have a look because what's happened is over the winter there's been so much debris come down the brook and spoil and things, but it's just all mounded up on the sides and we think that it's covered over the pipe, um, but we can't actually find it at the moment. We've, we've done this section because it's on a three metre by three metre, three what words, so we've gone effectively, if you think three metres each side of where we thought it was going to be, plus three metres, so we've done sort of nine metres. Um, and we didn't find it. So our next, uh, we're going to go and look for the other ones and then we're going to come back here and we'll have to dig in the field, a trench, until we find it. We've done the water divining rods, we've gone along and then the, it told us effectively that it was there. Um, it didn't work, unfortunately. So uh, you can look at the floor, you can just see the peas are just starting to come through. They've been in the ground now 10 days. Um, so we drilled half the field and then we we're now trying to get back to the rest of the field we've got one more field after this which the challenger there's a good rooting structure here so there's a there's one of the peas so you can see how well it's grown um in the last 10 days it's warm it's wet it's perfect growing conditions in that sense um, we had uh, 20 degree heat yesterday um, so we're on the sort of, I suppose, getting into the third day of some decent weather now. And the ground you can see on heavy chalk boulder clay is drying up uh, on the top, but really wet underneath. And then you've got these wet patches, which we're trying to solve. Right, so th this, this is some of the, 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 the issues. We're having to clear up all this, this dead, these timber branches and things. Because what's happening is it's growing over. And then all this debris, this other wood that's coming further upstream, it's coming down here, then the water level's getting so high, it's then hanging on the branches. And you can see back here, for all, all along here across the brook, it's then hanging on the sides of, of the, um, the wood and it blocks the river. Of course, then what happens is it starts flooding out into the fields. And this is all just due to the fact that there's absolutely no maintenance going on at all. Um, so it, we're, we're having to do it, even though that side is actually somebody else's responsibility. We're having to clear this because, of course, the, the net effect is it's us that has the flooded crops because they've got a bank which goes up to an old railway line. Of course, it's not going up that high. It's going to flood into our fields first. So we've got to clear the obstacles. I think it's a little and often. It's quite a nice little brook. It's got a stone bottom to it, etc. Um, but then as soon as this debris gets there, what happens is it starts to come round on the sides and it starts to gouge out here because it can no longer get down its original line. And also the, the big willows, they're sapping up the root mass, it's getting further and further out, contract, making the river smaller and smaller and smaller there, suddenly to the point that um, the water's struggling to get through, then all the debris falls in front of it and uh, you just acerbate the problem. If you look at the dark lines, you can see in the field here, that is where the, the wet holes are um, and it's almost in a line when it's coming across. So we're trying to find where the pipe comes into here and we think that the sediment has got built up on the sides and has buried the pipes. Um, so we've got to try and resolve that and get the rubbish out at the same time, which unfortunately has been dumped in the river. Graham, we've arrived. Yeah, not this time. Right, uh, and we have to get that bloody trolley out, Graham. Oh, hold on, this is promising, Graham. This is promising. Go on, get your digger, then. 
Let's fetch this out. A bit of pipe. So this is a broken end of a drainage pipe. So it's either a sewer pipe that's washed down or it's actually part the end of the, the drain pipe that we're looking for, which is encouraging. We're in the right area, Graham. I don't know, Graham, there's a hole there. Yeah. 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 Or if somebody lives in here. Oh! There's no water though, Graham, which is strange. Oh, you'd expect to see. Just give it another bucket there. I was looking for the bank to see if it was going to start weeping, but I think we're going to have to do the other way, Graham. We're going to have to put the bucket on and dig a line. You need to get spraying though, don't you? I had to go and find them this morning. I don't think I've put a pair of wellies on for some years. But uh, I knew that was going to be deep in there. In fact, it was probably a little bit deeper than I thought because I've got a, uh, I've got wet legs. <laughs> oh dear. Right, so that, that, that failed. So now we're going to have to come up with a new plan. So I think what we'll probably do now is we'll, uh, Graham's got to go spraying because the conditions are fantastic. So he's got to get the uh, fungicide on the wheat at, uh, and some growth rig. So he'll go and get that done. Then we'll come back tomorrow. Um, I think we're going to dig a trench along the outside of the track and we're going to try and find the gravel then the drain below. And then we'll probably end up digging across once we've found it, put a brand new six meter uh, twin wall piping um, and put it out into the into the brook so it can be you know we don't have to keep doing this even if we get some spoil so uh, the only uh, only downside of that of course is that it then in itself becomes a branch for collecting uh, rubbish and becoming a barrier but to the fact we found the plastic pipe full of mud is is um, positive we are in the right area uh, three what words actually is quite a a good way of marking land drains on uh, plans. So effectively we've got 72 hectares left to drill. We are two weeks late from the really the cutoff date that we would have done it. The crop is grown in contract, the value of that crop is £162,000. So effectively us not being able to get these fields drilled because of the conditions and, and the fact that we can't, the land drains aren't functioning is actually quite a problem for us. This problem is, is new. Um, I had this drained in 2011. Um, so this is a new problem to us. And um, to, the, the main reason we're still drilling, which in a normal year, perhaps you would have probably have put an end to it, is that because it's in contract, there are commitments I've, I've taken to, to grow this crop. Secondly, the seed is paid for, uh, the, the land is here. So it's gonna be better to get half a crop and mitigate the, uh, the loss and it is to take the whole 62, 162 on, on, on the chin. Uh, this is the, one of the problems in farming is that we're battling against the weather and uh, political pressure. And actually, uh, as a rule, the margins are so tight that we can't afford these type of problems. Hence why we're trying to solve, solve the problem while we're trying to drill. So see what tomorrow brings. Oh no, I mean, if, if, we were, if we were drilled up, then we would be very happy if it rained in, in that sense, but of course, um, yeah, we're not. Right. So we're now at the grain store, climbed out of the ditch. Um, so that was unsuccessful in finding the land drain, so we're going to try again tomorrow. Graham's gone spraying now to, uh, to maximise on the good weather. So uh, the grain store busy, 
So there's currently about seven lorries here which are tipping grain. They're bringing uh, wheat in on behalf of uh, a storage customer, Viterra, and uh, they're also taking wheat out um, that uh, we've either cleaned or looked after in the grain hospital. So uh, Gordon and um, Steve are here and we'll have a chat with them. I thought we'd have some better looking lorry drivers. Unfortunately, we've got you two. Well, I think we're the best. <laughs> Is it a crime? <laughs> this is where we um, bring the lorries in and check the passports, make sure everything's above board, make sure pass loads are not on sensitive list and things like that. Um, samples are taken with the spear outside, come in through here. That's where it's collected. So uh, we've got a NIR. Um, machine which tests the moisture, protein, um, and thousand grain weight. So uh, this is a shakeometer, so that grades the um, wheat into bold, mid, small, and dust sample. Again, to to grade what what you've got, is there a lot of rubbish in there, or is it all good stuff? Um, moving on, we've got a Hagberg machine which. Um, Test, test for bread making, has the protein in there, there it tests. Um, and over here we've got a, a bug machine. So another shaker, shakes bugs out. Um, they're in the sample under the heat lamp. If there's anything alive, they'll come alive and start wriggling. Traceability, we've got um, every sample we bring in, in and out. We have a sample bag, and that's that's kept for the year. So, started here last June, gone down, up, <laughs> and we're currently gone down there. So that's everything coming on farm and off farm. We keep a sample for traceability. Um, so any anything, any issues that come up, we can find the ticket, find the sample, rerun tests, that clarify things. So. We're, we're at the grain store and uh, lorries are coming in, they're bringing loads of wheat in. There's a big difference between uh, old priced wheat and new priced wheat. So refilling the sheds uh, in May um, to carry across. Uh, it's a good time for us because um, it's usually historically a quieter time for the lorries. So we're quite pleased for the work. Um, and we're also blending um, different uh, low Hagberg wheat and high Hagberg wheat together to get a better a result. And uh, this lorry here, is that we just changed the lorry, it's four days old and unfortunately the door got um, hit by another vehicle. So four days old, that is just bad luck. So uh, that's why it's not sign written, it's just had a new door, it's been repainted and now we've got to uh, have it sign written. Um, somebody damaged the trailer and um, we had the panels all put in and it was pa it repainted but Whoever's repainted that's completely painted it the wrong colour. I don't know what's happened there. Have you washed it so clean that it's changed colour? I, I believe so. I've been asked Good, that needs respraying. New combine just been delivered by um, Class, and um, there's four of them, and they're all PDI in them. It's going to take them a few weeks to get them ready for us. But yeah, this is a brand new combine. The last new combine I bought was in um, 2009. So all the combines after that I had were all somebody else's and uh, I bought them at four and five year old and then ran them for another three years. But we decided that, that we would start fresh again and uh, we've got a good engineer, Simon. He, he'll look after them through the season, working with class and uh, the idea is to have less downtime and, and because downtime, of course, when you've got all the lorries in the field, you've got 10 lorries sitting there, you've got chaser bins, you've got combines, you've got combines stopped. Well, 25% of your output is, is, is stopped. Well, that then has a knock-on effect because the guys at the grain store, they're all waiting for the lorries to turn up. They're waiting for the, uh, uh, the grain to come in. So then suddenly you create an inefficiency in the business just from unreliability. So we've gone new, hoping that we'll uh, 
sort of cut down on the, the amount of breakdowns that we were suffering. Well, they took me to Germany. Was it? And I signed it in the factory. What was it signed with? Um, per permanent marker. Right. And then when I came back, um, yeah. I was excited because it was sort of going to be my combine, yeah. <laughs> which is an odd thing to say, but not, anyway, it? and it wasn't, and then it was buffed out and it had a, yeah. it was all, um, was it? yeah, when I saw it though, it was on pram wheels. Where was it? Yeah. Oh, right. I see they've gone with a open cover. Yeah, they have now, yeah. Huh. That was a bit of an idea for it case. Both checking oil levels. And yeah, that. it is. Yeah, so this is an 8,000 ton shed. Um, there are six of these, uh, three in a line, 20,000 in the middle, three in a line again. So uh, currently this is uh, feed wheat, which is going out. Um, once it's out, we'll re re repipe the store and it's going to be filled with, I believe, milling wheat. So uh, the, the line of the grain goes up the walls. You can see the dust line up to the bottom of the conveyor, back down the other side across, comes up again, and this belt in the middle fills it from the center. And once it gets to the peak, it works left, then right, make sure that it's equally filled all the way across to the doorway. The doorway's got barriers that they put in the front. And then the angle of a pose of the grain works on the underside here, comes across down into the, into the bottom about there. So you can take out three ton, five ton, whatever you want to take out without having to take the boards out. It just keeps coming towards you the whole time. The pipes step down inside for ventilation purposes. The probes hanging down in the store. We've got the white probes and got the long black ones. The long black ones come down to get bolted to the pipes. They've got three uh, temperature probes on them. And the white ones obviously have one. They go in the top, fully automated, turns the fans on and off. So I'll show you the fans, which, uh, you know, they, they just turn on and off at night mainly or uh, if they go on at the day, the solar's providing the energy. Solar's become quite important to us. These are the fans, silence fans. We keep them in a lean-to so that it keeps it quiet uh, and stops the, um, the rain getting into them and then ultimately blowing into the crop. So they turn on and off according to humidity. So if it is wet outside, the fans won't come on. It's an automatic uh, system and uh, dub double, double motors there. The solar got statics here, 50 kilowatt. Now we're currently just drawing up a scheme, got the grid connection to, um, to double this. Uh, we're using, because the, the, the grain hospital is becoming so successful in what it's doing through, through the efforts of Gordon and Steve, but the, the demand and electricity is increasing. So we've got to offset that. And so we're currently looking at a plan to install this potentially by June. Um, which we would double this within the sort of curtilage that it's currently in. These solars here, these are the first ones I put in. These were 2012, these were 2010, these were the first in the, in the UK. Uh, they are um, Dega trackers and they basically turn with the direction of the sun. So they're often at different, um, different positions depending where they're most efficient. The point of them was they're 34% more efficient than the statics. The difference was these cost 60,000 to install back in 2012 and I got a feed-in tariff of about uh, something in the region of about 27 pence. These I've got a feed-in tariff of about 35 pence but it cost me 180,000 pounds to put them in because of the, um, the cost of uh, the, the, the rotating aspect and actually we'd, we were going forward we're going to go for this type because we have the land, we have the area. Now, what, the reason if you look at the shed behind, we don't have them on the roof of the shed. And the reason for that is in, when you consider that the grain, each shed is 8,000 tonnes. Well, at 200 pound a tonne, crudely, you've got 1.6 million in there. So the entire site it will, will have something probably in the region, depending on what you've, you're storing, but could have something like 12 million to to 15 million work, pounds worth of uh, grain underneath. So if then the bolts that you put through the roof uh, elongate, and then you start to get water that comes through, you've got water ingress into grain, you damage the grain, you then get bugs in it, you then get hot spots, you start using more energy, 
and then you have to gas it so you've got to use chemicals to kill the bugs or at worst you lose the condition and the premium in the product. So it wasn't worth the risk for me putting on the roofs. Now currently the government's doing a new scheme where they will support farmers putting solar on the roofs. Of course the problem with that is, as I rightly said, that what, what's below could be at risk. Uh, it's a shame actually that they don't sort of just support the concept of solar, not the concept of solar on a roof. The other issue with the roofs is those roofs are 10 and a half metres high to the eaves and, and 17 and a half in the peak. Well, to get somebody up there to go fix them, electrician or to go and clean them, that's actually a, um, that's a specialist individual for safety. Coming down here, we can wash these ourselves. These ones here, we can put them into a static mode and wash them. Uh, I, I don't like the concept of putting them on the roof. We, we are looking at it on a new shed that we've got planning permission for, which was for machinery storage. But uh, the thought of maintaining them and then finding steeple jacks or somebody to go up there to, to look after them, sort of I think was going to be a dangerous. And if you look at the risk in farming, in terms of um, health and safety record, which is the worst industry, a third of the problem is either age, but uh, outside of um, uh, you know 65 plus, or um, below 18, so children, and uh, one of the common causes of death is falling from height. So coming up with ideas to to create things at height, I don't think, considering the industry's uh, background, is a very good idea. You see, like here, you know, this is basically my barley crops. Um, so interestingly, this area here, which is, you know, the barley's really behind. This is where I've put fertilizer before when I had human sewage uh, put on here, which is an amazing fertilizer. But um, it sort of really stunted the crop back, too rich in nutrients um, and uh, in a concentration form. And also there'll be a level of compaction from the fact it was delivered there with lorries, etc. But that aside, you can see now the barley crop is starting to come into ear and the ear is what is effectively the grains are formed in and it's the grains in which we harvest. So as a rule, you look at that crop and you say that's eight weeks to harvest. Now that's quite frightening for us because it's the most exciting time, but that's why we've got to get the combines ready. That's why there's suddenly there's a level of urgency. You've got crops forming. You can see harvest is coming. We're at the stage where the grain will fill then it will start to die off and go golden. That's when we'll harvest it. Now that the, the, the clock is set, so we have to have everything finished and done before um, harvest. We have to be ready because harvest waits for nobody. And uh, my most exciting time of the year, I love harvest. It's what I think farmers dream about. Uh, it's a funny thing, harvest. At the beginning, you're really enthusiastic depending on how well it yields and how well it goes, by the middle, you're either uh, wishing it ended or uh, you're really excited and happy that it's carrying on. And that, that pretty much depends on what the yield is and how the season's going. But yeah, it's a funny thing that you, you love it, you, you dream all year about it and then you get halfway through it and you wish it end. <laughs> the trails of being a farmer. I forget now, but something of 3,000 tonnes, something like that, they had to do several piles. Um, and it's like black gold um, sewage sludge. So basically, when anyone flushes the toilet, it goes down the pipes, it goes to the main sewers, goes to the treatment plants, it's treated. And then uh, if we're lucky enough to be able to buy it, they, we can buy it for the farms, we put it on the land, and it's fantastic at restoring uh, phosphate uh, and also gives nitrogen. So the, the, the really the, the three elements that, which are the most important for growing a good crop is nitrogen, phosphate and potash. And that uh, is, is exactly what um, uh, sewage sludge has in it. Of course, there are other things when you go into sulfur and etc. but they're the key ones, N, P and K. So we had a pile here and you can see that the land hasn't recovered from having that sat here. Um, it's the sheer weight um, and also, you know, it will be the fact that there is a big concentration of um, nutrients which have sat here far greater than what the um, crop would have wanted and you can often see that across the country where people have put um, piles of um, manure and things so anyway hopefully we'll be able to um, uh, subsoil this and try and reinstate it and bring it back to life and uh, you know perhaps plough it 
and uh, you know get rid of this problem but it's highlighted in this barley crop now this barley crop is changing dramatically so you almost got the stages of barley going on here so here you are you've got your leaves you know coming out you've got then just here you can just start to see that this part here is what will form the grains so there you go these here they are what will form grains so they haven't bulked out at all it's just forming at the stage then these will get bigger and you saw in the grain hospital that sorry in the grain lab they'll get sort of that size and then that's ultimately what we harvest the straw um, which is the biomass of product from here down that will go golden that will die we will bale that and then that's actually going off to a power station um, and then that will produce electricity um, for people in their houses. So um, it's a bioproduct um, because they haven't took away the, um, the land from producing food for um, human beings. But the, the straw aspect of it is a byproduct. So actually, I'm quite pleased that we can produce energy and food in the same field at the same time. We've got three diggers, which we hire from a great company up in Lincolnshire, Stephen Green. And um, he's very supportive of us, which we're forever grateful. But we have um, three guys that basically in the winter, once we've finished cultivations and drilling, etc., we'll get on diggers and they go and dig the ditches out in a rotation. So in a six, seven year rotation, all the ditches will be dug out. Because within 10 years of not digging a ditch out, for example, you suddenly find it silted up you're losing um, land drains, it's that quick. And we, we dig, we're digging some ditches out, we might not have been dug out for 50 years. And, you know, that might be new land that we've taken on, etc. But yet the investment in drainage can be 3,000 pound an acre. It's a huge cost if you're gonna have a very intensive scheme put in. And because you can't see it, it doesn't necessarily get looked after. And I think one of the greatest investments in farming has got to be drainage because you cannot farm wetland. But if you actually have a well-drained field, you can produce a good crop, you're timely on your applications of getting on there, whether it's for chemicals or fertilizer, and also wet crops to get mauled, produce poor outcomes, to get leached, get runoff into, uh, into brooks and streams. You know, a well-farmed field actually prevents pollution. It's the best investment people could put in. It's paying for it is the big problem. And if there was ever a, an idea to invest in agriculture, in schemes or anything like that, it, it, drainage will, should be the number one um, for, form of um, investment because it lasts 50 years. Well, that's gonna outlive me. That's gonna outlive the next generation. I mean, that is a fantastic investment. Chris and Brooke um, are the building team and uh, they do all the building work here, so they'll do the repairs in their existing properties um, or they'll organise if, if it's an expertise they don't have. And then we're building um, currently an extension to this property. So this property was uh, um, originally about 1850, was two cottages. We knocked it into one in, in um, 99 and that's where I used to live. And we're now putting an extension on it and we're, we're starting to modernise it. So uh, Chris and Brooke are putting in a, a floor, then they'll concrete this. And th this is actually going to be a garage here. Then there'll be a non-suite um, bedroom, etc., upstairs. I, I typically plant about, I think, two to 3,000 metres of hedging a year. Not through schemes, just purely off my own back. And then put in a lot of trees as well. Um, my grandfather, he was very keen on um, conservation. Uh, conservation, not preservation. Uh, preservation is often where people decide not to do anything. Conservation, of course, is where you're making a difference and you're starting to conserve puro. So we'll, uh, we'll dig all this out. Uh, that will become grass. And we've got planning permission for the other side of that fence um, to extend the offices um, for um, rental to, to third parties. So um, there'll be a building going down there towards that red van, building across here, 
that actually will nicely block off the farm. Uh, there won't be windows looking this way. Um, and then that will create more privacy as well for that house because of course there will be a building down there without windows and then there'll be a lovely internal courtyard. Uh, we've already got a customer actually that wants it. He, he wants to put in a nursery for children, um, which would be nice because then people can drop their children off there and then go straight to work and then uh, bring them in. It's a perfect location with three miles just outside Cambridge um, and they want to build a park and ride so people will be able to uh, jump on the park and ride after they drop the children off and uh, go straight into work. So we're trying to sort of future-proof the farm uh, in, in terms of incomes and it's, you know, because the, the thing about farming is that there was generations. So my father, you know, my sister, etc. So, and then my grandparents and then my children. So each generation has to find a way of buying the other family members out. Um, so you have to do diversification, A, to survive in farming and B, to create an income which will then be able to maintain and look after my father or be able to buy my sister out, etc. So it's in, these other projects are actually very important. Having our own team of staff who are building them obviously is to reduce cost, um, but also to, one would hope, to maintain a level of quality. And, um, you know, we need to keep moving forward, creating them work. Uh, putting planning applications in, etc. Um, I'm very keen on houses, for example, for my staff, because I think it's really important that they um, live on site because of the nature of farming, the seasonality of it, the work hours. Um, suddenly, you know, we're going today, regardless of the day, and then it rains. But you need them to be able to walk to work, to walk back to work, not be driving for miles in a car. They need to get home, get the food in them, get washed, get, get to bed, get, get ready for the next day. Because when we've got to go, we've got to go. Um, and also security. It's important that um, you've got people surrounding the site, one for better word of security. We're a, a big farming unit. We've got a lot of fuel, a lot, a lot of uh, desirable objects which people want to come and steal. Security is key. Secondly, the grain stores. It's important that they can walk, walk in, check everything's running, go back. Uh, and not have to be there for 10 hours or, or whatever. They can just come in and go back, make sure it's okay. If the alarms go off to say that there's a problem in the grain hospital, they can come in, they can fix it, um, and they can take it in turns. You can't expect one man to do all the work. He's got to, to have holidays, he's got to have time with his family, etc. I like setting each enterprise up with a minimum of two people, a bit like Noah's Ark, where you know one's away, there's always cover. Um, so I'm keen on the fact that there's housing.